hissing out. I can maybe move it down. Praise the Lord. But um, our goal is to be able to video this and put it up on YouTube so that people can uh, that can't be a part physically here can watch it. And I do want to encourage everyone, we do have all of our services up on the YouTube channel, so you're welcome to check that out at Redlands Christian Center. If you go on the YouTube uh, site, just type in Redlands Christian Center and search us and we'll pop up. So we endeavor to try to put all of our services online so people can catch them. But praise the Lord, let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful that we can gather together in the wonderful name of Jesus. I thank you for each and every one of these that have come out. And Lord, we just trust the Holy Spirit to be with us this morning. And the Holy Spirit can move and can minister. Father, I offer myself up to be a mouthpiece. I thank you that each of these here might have something that they want to say in the input. And Lord, what is said will minister to each of us. I trust, Father, that as we... Uh, move from this place today, that your Holy Spirit will have spoken something that we can take out, that we can grow, that we can change, that we can increase. I thank you, Father, for hearts that are hungering, hearts that are thirsting. Father, that we are seeking to know you in a closer relationship. And Father, we give you all praise and all glory. In Jesus' name, we all said amen, amen. Well, I want to thank uh, Sister Michelle, who um, God actually put it on her heart to start a Bible study uh, during the week for people to come. And so she talked to me about it, and I said I would be willing to do that because one of the things I committed to when I went into the ministry is that whoever would ask, I would do what I could to meet a need, to be a supply. And I think that should be our goal as Christians is for God to use us in whatsoever way that he can. And sometimes it's surprising how God uses us. And sometimes it takes stepping out in faith when someone says, hey, can you do that? And you say, well, no, that's not my ministry, and I'm not even interested in doing that. But sometimes we step out and we do it, and we find that God has something there for us. And we find a hidden talent. We find something that God can use that we didn't even know was there. So when Michelle uh, talked to me about it, she said that God had put on her heart just a place for people to gather, not belonging to any church, not belonging to any denomination, not preaching any set message, but just whatsoever the Holy Spirit would have so that people could receive help, that people could receive a word, and people could find a place that they could come and they could interact and, and ask for answers, that they could have comments, that they could ask questions, and that we would endeavor as a group, as a gathering, to seek God and to find a way. Amen? So that's what we're here today. I want to give each and every one of you uh, these cards because this is what we're going to base our first several sessions on, is talking about who we are in Christ Jesus. And this is a little card that, that we've put together that is a compilation of scriptures uh, based on the Bible that you can read and you can reinforce as to who God has called you to be. Because I would say the most common thing that I find in people's lives is when people come to know the Lord, and we're going to talk first and foremost today about salvation, um, when people come to the Lord, that they don't really know what to do with it. Well, hello, Brother Overture. How are you doing? Oh, that's okay. Come on in, Brother. I was just saying that this is a casual time together where we can can gather. You can sit on the front row if you want, or you can go back a ways. Okay, amen. So let me give one of these cards to you, because this is what we're going to be doing. And if anyone needs a Bible, I've got some Bibles up here. But as Christians gather together, most people don't know what it is that they're called to do, and or how they're to operate in their Christian life. What things should change, what things um, don't change, why they struggle with certain things. So that's what we're going to be exploring. And like I say, we have no agenda here except to promote Jesus, except to promote a, a life that is worth pursuing. Because so many people in today's society, they feel, they feel like they have no value. They feel like they have no purpose, and they come, sometimes wander around lost. And God created each and every one of us uniquely, specially with a purpose and with 
a place in his body. And we're to function together. So that's why I like gathering people together. Uh, not so much that I can talk, but I like to hear from people because I learn. Sometimes someone says, like Belinda, we were talking about, you know, Christians hitting the snooze button, and that ministered to Belinda. Um, that was something that I said. But I find I hear comments and things that you say, and it it inspires me. And then I go and I research and, and I find out about it. So God wants to use each and every one of us to impact our lives, impact what we do. And so that's what we're going to, to explore. And in this, in Christ I am, is what we're going to be starting with. In the first, um, first verse there, it says, I am saved by the grace of God because I have confessed with my mouth and I believe in my heart that Jesus died for my sins and God raised him from the dead. Jesus is my Lord. I am a child of God. So the very basic foundation of a Bible study is, of course, salvation. And the word salvation means protected from harm and delivered. Um, and many people have different terms. When you talk about being saved, salvation to me means that God has saved me, he's delivered me, but in the salvation that I've studied, I've come to find out so much in the, in the Bible about what God's word says about salvation, and it means that I'm healed, I'm delivered, I can have prosperity, I can have peace, I can have joy, I can have love, I can have life, I can be blessed, and it goes on and on. So to me, salvation is an amazing thing. But I would like to hear from any of you that are willing to share. And again, this is all based on what you're comfortable doing. Does anyone have something they would like to say about what salvation means to them? Michelle? Amen. So you have a knowing of your salvation, you're convinced of your salvation, and you have an assurance that if you miss the mark or if you aren't living to your fullest one day or things mess up or, you know, you make a left turn instead of a right turn, that God still loves you, that he's still there for you, and that you can come to him and confess your sin according to what the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we're faithful and just to confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that you have a safe place. So salvation for you, it sounds like one of the key things is that it's a safe place. It's a place where you can always go to and know that God still loves you. So his forgiveness and his mercy, that's good. Anyone else want to share? Brother Overture. So at one time, we all have sinned and fallen short. Mm -hmm. We're here today by the grace of God. Amen. And we just praise God and thank God for the grace that he has given us to um, be obedient to his word. And, you know, like I said, we all have issues, but God, he's there. He will not forsake us. He will give us the strength to become like our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So, so what I took from what you just said is that God gave us right standing, right standing, right standing to go into his presence, Amen. that we're now able, because of salvation, Amen. to come into the presence of a holy God, to, to be received by the most, the highest being, the creator, which in and of ourselves, we weren't worthy. And, and you said another key thing is that we didn't even have a desire to go there. We had a desire to maybe just live our own life, do our own thing, live the best we can, but he gave us a new identity, a, a pass to be in his presence and to be welcome there at any time because the word of God says that we can go boldly before the throne of grace to obtain mercy, to obtain help, and to be received. 
So that's another good thing about our salvation in God. Did anyone else have anything about what salvation means to them? Virginia. Amen. And Brother Overture said that too, someone that will never leave us nor forsake us. And if we think about having a relationship with God who created this world, who created these bodies that are so unique, how amazing is it that he thinks highly of us, that he wants to have fellowship with us? How many of you think that, um, let's say that, you know, the President of the United States, how many of you think that the President of the United States is thinking about us as individuals and he's waiting for us to come visit the White House? He doesn't know us. He's got so many people here in the United States that would love to come and visit the White House, but he can't, he can't possibly know us. He can't possibly receive all of us. Yet our God, the creator of the universe, wants us in his presence. He welcomes us to his throne room, and he waits for us. Isn't that an amazing thing about our salvation? So... In salvation, that's the very first thing that we need to understand um, who we are in Christ Jesus. And I was saying that um, when I was studying this, that I went to the book of John. And if any of you need a Bible, I have a couple here up on the front. But I wanted to go to John chapter 1 and establish the, the fact, the truth, that Jesus is our salvation. You know, many, many groups talk about um, a God, and they acknowledge that God may be many things, and God is many things. But our salvation, according to the Bible, and I believe in the Bible as God's infallible word, that God's word that is instruction for us, the Bible is very clear that the way to God the Father is through his son Jesus. In fact, we know from Scripture that Jesus is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. And Scripture tells us that no man may come unto the Father but through Jesus. Jesus is the one who made the way for us. What he did at the cross made a way for us to have this wonderful, glorious salvation that we have. So let's look at John chapter 1. And verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Now I want to jump down to verse 14. And it says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, this was he of whom I spoke. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So as we study the word, we begin to understand that, that, that this word, the Bible that we read, is Jesus. Jesus and the word are one. Now that's hard for our minds to comprehend, but that's what the Father tells us. The Father tells us that he sent his son Jesus so that we could have a, a Savior who lived perfectly on this earth, who could die for our sins, who could pay the price for all the sin of mankind, and he could live that perfect life, but that he could establish and validate this written word with the blood that he shed, with the Spirit of God that, that God the Father sent after Jesus to bear witness unto the life that Jesus manifest here on earth, and that we could receive all that Jesus has done for us because of the life that he lived here on this earth. It says he was confronted with every sin, with every temptation that man has known. Jesus was tempted with it, and he was able to pass the test. He was able to make the way. 
so that we could have that life and that life more abundantly in Christ Jesus. So this salvation that we have is through Jesus. So many people think that, well, I know God. I'm a good person. I live a good life. And I endeavor to do that which is good. And maybe they know about, in the Old Testament, they know about the Ten Commandments. And they say, you know what? I don't kill. I don't steal. I don't commit adultery. I don't lie. I live a good life. And I know who God is. But Scripture, if we read it, tells us that the only way to have salvation, to know and to be able to access God, to go boldly before his grace, to have our names written in the book of life, the only way to the Father is through what Jesus did and to know Jesus and his word. And so that's why it's so important for Christians to understand. And, and I could even go so far as to say, because, you know, in, in a Bible study like this, we may have people from many different backgrounds, many different churches, and they maybe don't even like the term Christian. And you know what? That's okay. I don't have a problem with that. We can call ourselves anything. The important thing is that we know Jesus that we have received Jesus as our Lord and our Savior. We believe that he died on the cross for our sins, that God raised him after three days, that he paid the price, and that we confess Jesus, that we call Jesus our Lord, and we call upon him. In fact, one of the scriptures um, on this card, this first one that we've read, Romans 10, 9, let's look at that. And we will see, what, what is salvation? So Romans chapter 10, verse 9. And this is in red letter in the Bible. Um, so if you have a red letter edition Bible, it tells you that Jesus is speaking this. And so Jesus is saying, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and go out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal, kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and life more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catches them and scattereth the sheep. And so we see that Jesus says, I am the door. You have to come in by the door of Jesus. And so in order to have this salvation, we need to understand that Jesus is the key. So many people think that they know God, but they don't know the Savior. They don't have a relationship with Jesus. And without that relation, it says we can't get in into the right door. If you have someone into your home, don't you invite them into the front door? Do you make them go through the window? Do you make them go up the roof and climb down the chimney? No, anyone that comes in that way, they're coming in without your blessing, without your permission. Because anyone that you come in comes in through your front door and you open that door and you welcome them as a guest. That's the proper way to come into someone's house. And so Jesus tells us, that he is the door, and if we come in, that we shall come into the Father's presence through Jesus. So Jesus is how salvation comes, and in Romans, the other scripture that's referenced on this particular scripture is Romans chapter 8, verse 16. You know what? I think I read, I read you out of John, didn't I? So I'm going to go back to Romans, and where it talks about how we confess with our mouth because um, that was another scripture I had that Jesus is the door. But let's go to Romans chapter 10, verse 9. If I remember reading the wrong scripture, say, um, Pastor Sandy, you just read the wrong scripture. Hallelujah. So we'll go back and read this before we go to Romans chapter 8. Romans 10, verse 9 says, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So this is the foundation for our salvation, is that we have to confess, again, that Jesus is Lord, and believe that, again, that he is the door that we have to pass through in order to get to the Father. The Father set this up because he knew that man would sin, that man would need a way 
for salvation. That man would need a way, like Michelle was talking about, that when we miss it, that we have an advocate, that we have someone who is there to speak to the Father on our behalf. I know in household situations, typically it's the mother who the kids come to and say, Mom, Mom, I, I want to do this, but I don't think Dad's going to let me. And the mom says, well, you know what? Why do you want to do this? And the mom asks all the questions. The mo mom determines. And if she thinks it's a good thing, guess what? She'll go to the father on behalf of the child, and she'll say, you know, our daughter wanted to do this. She didn't think you would say, what do you think? Well, I say, no. You know, that's the immediate reaction. The mom says, okay, okay, well, wait a minute. You know, let's think about this. So the mother becomes an advocate for the children. And, you know, then maybe talks the father down or, or softens the father, makes the way for the child to approach the father. And then the father's prepared and he'll say, okay, well, I'll let you this time, but, you know, you better not mess up. You better not do that. And so Jesus is our advocate. We can go to Jesus with whatever we've done and say, Jesus, I know I messed up, you know, and, and I need some help. And Jesus says, I go before the Father. And the Father doesn't see what you've done because I've already taken care of it. I've already paid the price. So when the Father sees us, he sees us in our born-again, perfected state. Because Jesus has been our advocate. He's already gone and made the way smooth for us before the Father. So that's the key to our salvation is having a relationship with Jesus Christ. And again, it doesn't matter in terms of if you come from this denomination or that denomination or this church or that church. We're here to talk about Jesus. We're here to talk about how we live this life on a day-to-day -day basis, doing the best we can, knowing that we have an advocate with the Father because of what Jesus has done for us. Amen? And now let's go back to one of the other scriptures on this card, Ephesians chapter 2, and talk about what some of you already shared when we were talking about salvation. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Now, the very first confession that we have on this card is, I am saved by the grace of God because I have confessed with my mouth and I believe in my heart that Jesus died for my sins and God raised him from the dead. So we read out of Romans 10, 9 that we're to confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord. But the first part of that we see out of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Now, let's talk about grace for a little bit, because um, I think that was what Michelle um, said that she likes about salvation. That's what salvation mostly means to her, is the grace of God. What is grace? You know, and I wrote down the definition. Grace is, if you use just the letters, God's riches at Christ's expense. Christ paid for our grace. And he gives us his riches because of what he did for us. And I know... I know most all of you, and I know you all to be very kind, giving people. You do what you can. You like to bless others. And a lot of things that you do, you don't do because someone gave you money for it or paid you for it or anything else. You did it because you wanted to do something nice for someone else. That's grace. You know, she, Mama here has, has blessed us with so many um, things of tortillas and rice and stuff. She cooks for us because she knows we like it. Virginia, I, I mean, so many of you have done things for us that just because you love us and you have a relationship for us, not because we've deserved any of it, but because you wanted to bless us. You, you just had it in your heart. Sister Valinda has given me some Dr. Pepper and she's given Pastor Don some cranberry juice because she wanted to bless us. That's God's grace extended when out of the blue someone does something for you and blesses you. Today, Michelle, um, not only did she volunteer to do child care for these Bible studies, but she prepared some snacks for us in, in the room for us afterwards. That's God's grace, to be blessed 
and for someone to think about us before we thought about what we needed or what we wanted, someone blesses us. And that's what God did before the foundations of time when he saw us. He says, I am creating a people, and I want to have this family. I know they're going to mess up. I know they're going to sin. I know they're going to fall, but I'm going to make a way, and I'm going to give an ultimate sacrifice so that I can have communion and fellowship with them. Because God, being a perfect God, it says he has so much glory, so much perfection that we can't even be in his presence. That if we were to go before God in this state that we're in, even if we're a good person doing good things, that we would burn up because his great perfection, we can't even achieve that. We can't even be in, in that God's presence, but by the grace of God. And this God loved us so much that he says, I have my son Jesus who is one with me, and I'm going to send him to earth in the form of a man so that he can suffer every sin, every temptation that man has ever suffered, and that he can die on the cross and pay a penalty that he didn't deserve. And if any of you have seen any of the movies, The Passion of the Christ, or any of the, the movies where it shows the great affliction that he was in, I can't even hardly watch it. I can't watch things where human beings are tortured and, and, and killed. It, it just grieves me so much. And to think that Jesus willingly went to the cross so that we could have presence with the Father because of what Jesus did, that is grace. And it says, for this grace, we're saved. It's not anything any of us did to deserve it. And that's another wonderful thing why people can come together in Bible studies, in churches, in gatherings, and it doesn't matter what our it is, it doesn't matter what we've done, it doesn't matter where we've been, it doesn't even matter where we're going. It's we're gathered by this grace, by what God did for us. And so the scripture tells us, for by grace are we saved through faith. So what does faith have to do with it? That's our part. This grace is available to the whosoevers. Whosoever will. You today are the whosoever wills. You chose to come into God's house. You chose to come into a gathering to assemble yourselves around a Bible study so you, by faith, came believing that God is going to meet us here, that God is going to give each and every one of us something to feed us, to encourage us, to strengthen us, to let us know that we're special. So for by grace, God's riches at Christ's expense were saved through faith, through us believing that God is making a way for us and that Jesus is making that way with the Father because of what he did. So that's our faith. So by grace are we saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. And so today we're all thankful for the gift of God that he gave us for salvation. And now we can start on this road if we believe this, we have salvation in God, and as Michelle said, we have assurance that we're saved. I talk to some people, and, you know, we talk about, um, are you born again? Are you saved? And that language kind of puts some people off because they don't know, what are you talking about born again? What are you talking about saved? Well, do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Well, I, I know God. I went to church when I was a child, and I... Yeah, I, I know. Are you saved? What does that mean? It means, have you confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord? It means that are you pursuing this great salvation that was given to us by grace? And are you willing to give something to God that you have within you? Anything that you have. And, well, if, if you think I'm a preacher, no, I'm not a preacher. You know, I go to church on Easter, and I go to church on Christmas. So if you mean that salvation, well, yeah, then I'm saved. No, we're talking about a relationship. We're talking about a God who so loved each of us that he gave his son so that we could enter in through the front door, Jesus, and we could have 
that life and life more abundantly in Christ, giving him now back these lives that we have and saying, Lord, here I am. Take me as I am. And he says, I gave everything just for what you are. So, Lord, take it and now use it in some way, shape, or fashion. And God says, okay. And that puts us on the road of salvation. And we can do as much and get as high in God as we want. We can study this word to show ourselves approved. And we can become ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ just by saying, here I am, God, use me. And when we study God's word, we see that there's many parts in the body of Christ doing many things. Uh, some people, they say, well, all, all I can do is just, you know, be a greeter and smile. That's a wonderful gift. Being out wherever you work or whatever you do. And I know Justin's going to school. Just being a student and interacting with other students and doing what the word of God is, letting your light so shine before men that you're... Father in heaven may be glorified. That is a work of the ministry. Just being who we are called to be, our personalities uniquely created in God. And most people begin to be intimidated and think, well, this sister does that and that brother does that, and I don't seem to be able to do any of that. You know, we need to come to God just as we are and offer him what we have. He's the one that uses everything for his good, for his glory. And all he wants is willing participants, those that are willing to come to him in faith, believing that he is God, believing that he sent Jesus so that he can equip us and use us just as we are, wherever we're at in life, whatever we're doing. And the paths that we all find to God may be different, but they all have to come through Jesus. And people can say, well, that's a very narrow religion. It is the word. If you believe in God, God says that I sent the word to dwell among you. This word is life to you. And those who find it find life. So it's not narrow. Um, how many of you uh, know who Ben Carson is? He's a, a presidential candidate. And, um, you know, I listen to him. I enjoy some of the things that he says. And he was talking about something, and he's, he's a great man of faith, and he boldly declares his testimony. And someone said to him, they were interviewing him, and they said to him, um, you know, Mr. Carson, what do you say to these critics that say, you know, what you say is so controversial? And he looked at him, and he's a very quiet, spoken man, and he said, it's not controversial to me. It's only controversial to them. He says, I have no problem with it, so it's not a controversy. Therefore, I'm not in controversy with anyone. It's like, well, amen. This, this way that some people say is exclusive, I say, you know what? It's only exclusive if you choose not to get on this path. This path is a path of blessing. Like I say, when I think of salvation... My goodness, I find life, I find blessing, I find peace, I find hope, I find healing, I find eternal life, I find everything that I have need of in this word and in Christ. So it's not a narrow way to me. It is a life. It is a future. It's taken everything I've done wrong in the past taken it away, and set me on a good path, a path that can be filled with living water, with increase, with unlimited hope for blessing and life for my children, for my children's children. Should Jesus tarry down through the generations, I can pray over my family and believe for them to find it. It is unlimited. This word cannot be totally understood by man because it's, it says it's a living word. That means that you can read it and read it and read it and never find the end to its full meaning. How many of you have looked into a diamond, you know, a, a well-cut diamond? 
you can look into that diamond and you can never see, quote unquote, the end of it or every aspect of it because a diamond reflects light. So depending on the light in the room, where you look at it, which angle you look at it, it's always different. Yet you can see it, it's there, but you can never see and fathom and understand all the depths of its limit. God is so much more and God's word is so much more. And people say, well, you know, I, I read it and I don't understand it. Ask God for help. It's as simple as that. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you meditate God's word. Ask a friend to pray with you. Get into a Bible study where you share and where you explore God's meaning. And that's what, what we're here to do is we're here to explore what does salvation mean? What does in Christ mean? And to get us on this road of discovery. Because for me, God doesn't end. He says, I am the Alpha, I am the Omega, I am the beginning, I am the end. In other words, we, we will never get to God's end because he is all in all. We in this life were a finite creation in this body. We had a beginning, we were born, we have so much time to live on this earth, but at some point we know that this life is finite. But in God, we know our spirit man is going to live forever. Now, if you are a person that ends this finite life without Jesus, you may find your eternal living is in a place that is not designed for us, a place called hell. I believe in a literal heaven, according to the word of God. I believe in a literal hell, a place that was designed for angels. The word of God says, and we could study that out at some future time, that God did not create a hell for man. Man is his creation. And man, God loves man and wanted to have a relationship in a glorious place called heaven, a perfect place where we could have every blessing imaginable there. And so that's the road that I'm on. And so when someone says, boy, you're a narrow-minded person because you don't include everyone, I say, it's not narrow at all. It is a wide, beautiful road for those who find it. But you must find it through Jesus. He is the way. Now, that is the one way you find God. So like I say, I don't care what r religion you label yourself if you find Jesus. And there's many, many different religions that are talking about that they find Jesus in their pursuit of God. And so I believe, how many of you have read out of the Bible, there's a parable about finding the pearl of great price, that there's a treasure, and that if you find it, you have found a great thing. And so I believe, along with the scripture, it says, uh, God says, if you seek me, you shall find me. So I believe if you're seeking things here on this earth and you begin seeking God and what is your meaning of life, that if you seek hard enough, you're going to find God. And if you find and you're looking for God, that God will help you find Jesus. And so I pray for people in religions that may not be teaching Jesus. I say, Lord, let them see you. Let them find Jesus. And there's many testimonies of people that find Jesus through pursuing a relationship with God when they didn't even know they were looking for a Messiah. But God wants, he's looking for the lost sheep, amen? And Jesus says, I will leave the 99 to go find the one. Because God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they want to have a relationship with mankind, amen? Amen. Let's go to Romans uh, chapter 8 now. Romans chapter 8 and verse 16. We're going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the Holy Spirit because we've talked about God. We've talked about Jesus the, Jesus the Son. And there's the third part to the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. And actually, let's go um, up to verse 13, and we'll start there. 
Romans 8, verse 13 says, For if ye lived after the flesh, you shall die. So we're talking about being a finite, having a finite life here on this earth. It says, But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So we understand that as we're born into these finite bodies, these finite lives here on this earth, we can do one of two things. We can live out our life as we see fit, or we can do what's being talked about here is through God's spirit, through being born again, through having a relationship with Jesus Christ, doing our best to mortify or put down the deeds of the flesh and live a life according to God's word, according to a relationship with God in being born again and not just living after whatever desire our flesh wants to have. Because we understand that our flesh can desire to do certain things. As we enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ and we submit ourselves to God and we begin to read his word and find out about the Ten Commandments and how we're supposed to conduct our lives, it means that we have to be disciplined, disciplined followers of Christ. That's what being a disciple of, of God or Jesus means. It means that we endeavor to do what pleases God according to his word. So that means putting this body down and living after the spirit. And it says in verse 15 that we've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we've received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So something happens when we receive this salvation, when we become born again, is that we now become children of God. We're born of natural parents. But when the Bible tells us in several scriptures, and this is just one section that talks about this, that when we become born again, we become a new creation in Christ Jesus, scripture tells us, and we become children of God. Our names get written in the Lamb's book of life. Jesus becomes uh, like our brother because Jesus is the son of God. He is God, the flesh. There's three, the Trinity, three in one, but we become born again. We become like the children of God. We become adopted in. Were we born of God? No, not the same as Jesus. Jesus was perfect in God. We are born into these fleshly bodies. We are born into sin. But after our redemption, something uniquely happens, and we become children of God. We become adopted in, and we're able to call God our heavenly Father. And verse 16 says, The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Now we can read over that quickly, but verse 17 is actually a very powerful covenant statement. It means that because of what God did for us in in inviting us by grace through faith to be saved, to be born again, to become children of God, it says we become joint heirs with Christ. Now, all of us in this room understand that if we're joint heirs on someone's will, that means we're entitled to some things, doesn't it? That's legal language. So God has just used legal language, and you'll find, and, and I'm a very... Um, black and white person, it's right, it's wrong, it's yes, it's no. Um, so the Bible is very um, intriguing to me because I find it full of legal languages. God says, if this, then that. If this, then that. And that to me makes perfect sense because I'm, like I said, I'm very motivated and how I live my life is if someone tells me, okay, Sandy, if you do this and this, that's your end result. And I go, okay, I can do this or this. And then I'm expecting that this be the end result. And so this Bible, for me, is a legal contract. And you will find when you study it, it is full 
principle of contractual obligations. God says, if you will hearken unto my voice, if you will be diligent and do what I've commanded you to do, then I will see to it that all these blessings come unto you. It's, it's a legal contract. God put his word on it. He says, my word is a yes and an amen. If I say it, it shall surely come to pass. And that's where our faith enters in and our believing. So in verse 17 of Romans chapter 8, we get back to that if we're adopted in, we become children of God, then we become heirs, and not only heirs, but joint heirs with Christ. Now, God has just elevated us, and I believe this is what Overture was saying when he said salvation to him means the ability to go into God's presence, to obtain help in time of need, to be welcomed into that place. God does it because he made a covenant relationship with us. He made him a joint heir with Christ. Now, did any of us deserve that? No. That's the grace of God. That's the gift of God. That's salvation. And so, again, when, when people say they reject this salvation, I say, why? You've just been handed an inheritance that you didn't have any necessarily right to. You, we hear of stories all the time where, you know, someone gets contacted by a lawyer and said, you know, so-and-so just passed away, and you've been named in their will. Well, I don't even hardly know so-and-so. Well, he named you in his will. It's not an impossibility for someone that you've just barely met that for whatever reason, they decided to name you in their will as a legal contract, and you can inherit something that's great that you didn't even have a relationship hardly with the, with the person. Now, God said that we can have this relationship with him, and we can be joint heirs with Christ and receive all the blessings that Christ has available to him. Now, this verse talks about two parts. It says, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Hi, Michelle. Come on in. And so as joint heirs with Christ, what is the suffering that we do? We don't have to go back to the cross and die. Jesus already paid it. But there are some things, and the Spirit talked about that earlier. It says, we mortify the deeds of the flesh. That is our part. That is any suffering that we have. It's that we put down our fleshly desires, and we live as Christ lived to the best of our ability, knowing that if we fall short, that we have an advocate with Jesus goes to the Father, redemption of sin, re redemption and salvation through forgiveness of sin. Amen? So we can be joint heirs. It just means that we surrender our will to God and say, nevertheless, so God, I don't want my will to be done. I want your will to be done. God, use me in whatever way you can use this personality. You created me. You made me. You had me in mind from the foundations of time. I am fearfully and wonderfully made according to the scripture out of Psalms. So God, use me. And so all God is asking is that we avail ourselves to him. And coming and being a part of Bible studies, coming and being part of, of churches, God says he places us and positions us where it pleases him. And just allowing the spirit of God to affirm to us that, as Michelle says, that yes, we are saved. Yes, we have an advocate with the Father. And yes, we have a life and a future and a hope in Christ Jesus. That is our part to pursue. And the only suffering that we have to have is to just mortify the deeds of the flesh, not let this body, this flesh, do everything it wants to do. Whether it wants to... Um, go participate in things that I know are not godly or whatever. After a while, when you're in God's presence, you don't want to do those things. They have no desire. But people that still struggle with those desires, God says, I never leave you nor forsake you. So no matter where we're at on our road to salvation and our road to victory in Christ, God is always with us. And he, like a good father, has us by the hand and says, keep coming. Just keep walking, just keep pursuing, 
keep going because I'm going to get you to your expected end. And he's not going to ever, 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 ever leave us. He always loves us. He is always right there with us through thick and thin, through trial and tribulation, through good time and through bad time. He's with us to help us stay on this journey in Christ. And I said something Sunday morning that the Holy Spirit had said to me, was talking to me about insurance. And we all should have insurance on our cars. You know, it's a good idea to have insurance on your homes. And, and in case something happens, we have a policy that says that in case of calamity, that we will get some help to recover and restore whatever was stolen or destroyed or accidentally damaged. That's what insurance is. And so I'm thinking about all those things when God started talking about insurance. He said, that's fine to have natural insurance. He says, but you need to have my insurance. And he told me that his insurance is assurance that we're in Christ. Assurance that we're in Christ. That's God's insurance. Because if we're in Christ, like I said, as we study this word, we're going to find that God always is with us. He always keeps us. He always makes a way of escape. If the enemy comes at us one way, he must flee seven. Um, I told the church Sunday morning, we have uh, Psalm 91 cards that are just like that, and it's the all whole of Psalm 91. And I said, you need to read Psalm 91 every day and several times a day until you've got it in your heart, because Psalm 91 is insurance for daily living. It tells you that if you dwell in the secret place of the Most High and abide under the shadow of the Almighty, you will say of the Lord, He is your refuge. And in His refuge, it says, you can take wing and you can hide under that. And that God will be your shield and your buckler. That if terror comes to you by day or by night, it shall not harm you. It says a thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you see the reward of the wicked. And it goes on and tells you that God will satisfy you with long life. He will not allow you to stumble and fall. He will keep you. So Psalm 91, just one little psalm out of this whole word, tells you amazing things about God's insurance. And it's an assurance that if you're in Christ, that that word can be yours. And I don't know about you, but people that say, oh, the Bible is a narrow way. This way keeps me. There's a lot of terror out there in this big, wide world. And if you want to be out in this big, wide world alone, on your own, you're taking a lot of chances. Because this great, big, wide world is filled with terrorism. It's filled with hate. It's filled with anger. In the world that I live in, in Christ, I find peace that passes all understanding. I find word like Psalm 91 that says that I can live peacefully knowing that my God is for me. And if God be for me, who can be against me? The whole wide world out there, though it may be on a wide path that accepts everything and lets the body do whatever the body wants to do out there in the wide world, it doesn't give any assurance for life, for peace, for blessing. It says, you're on your own, Jack, and just do what you can. But my road of salvation that I have found says I can have all these things in Christ. In Christ, I am blessed. Amen? Amen. So I'm going to end this part of the teaching. Does anyone have any questions or comments or things that they would like to share um, that might encourage and exhort us or just clarify anything that I said? It's never a silly question in God. Whosoever, whosoever wills. Um, in fact, there's a scripture, and I, I don't have the exact references, that says, um, mi God says, many are called, few are chosen. Uh, I believe that's, I think it's out of Romans. Um, and, you know, I've read that and I thought, oh, you know, God calls many people and we all kind of stand there and he only chooses a few. And then when I went and studied some of the, um, 
the the meaning out of the Greek, it really means many are called, but few choose. We're all called. In fact, uh, Scripture tells us that it's God's will that all man be saved. Does all man get saved? No, because few choose God's way. Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone come in by that door, they shall know me. Again, it's a whosoever. Whosoever wills is whosoever chooses. And, you know, several scriptures in the Old Testament talks about, um, I set before you, out of Deuteronomy, I set before you life and death. I tell you to choose life. And so life and death, and in Proverbs it talks about life and death are in the power of the tongue. Speak life, don't speak death, because it's, it's our choice. See, we get to choose all of this. Paul the Apostle says, um, the, the, if you're wise, you're going to study to show yourself approved. The Old Testament talks about many perish for lack of knowledge. It's not because God's withholding. It's all written here. Few choose to study it. Few choose the path that is narrow and leads to life. Many are on the wide path, on that wide road that leads to destruction. And that's that death. This mortal life, if we don't choose Christ, we end up in destruction. And that's why, you know, Scripture tells us... Um, that the gospel, that Jesus will not come back, that this world as we know it now will not end until the gospel is preached throughout the land and every creature has an opportunity. I believe that everyone has an opportunity to receive Christ. Some way, some shape, some form. You say, well, how does that happen? People, you know, in some faraway land um, that they don't teach Jesus. I believe God makes a way for them to find life. In fact, if you study um, the Native American Indians that were here on this land before it was discovered, they, they, had, they were very spiritual people. I believe they found God and they found Jesus. They may have called him something else, but I believe in reading some of their writings and, and how they studied and, and that, I believe they found Jesus because they were seeking. They were seeking after God. Michelle? And the Bible says, God chooses callings. God chooses, chooses people for yeah, specific persons. But the whosoever's or whosoever come to God. But the, the key is, is, again, religion is man's attempt to reach God. Christianity or being born again or being a follower of Jesus is our relationship, the, the relationship that we have through Jesus with God. And so it's important not to be religious in terms of, of just doing a form of godliness without the power, but having that relationship. Just like, and that's a, it's a good thing, the whosoever's. And, um, you know, we all have to do it, and we can all, uh, you know, have different interpretations, but it's important that we just keep going back to the Word. Jesus is the Word, and reading the Word, and letting the Holy Spirit reveal to us. And you said you had another question? You answered it. Oh, okay. I answered that in my long version. Ask me a question, and I can go 20 different ways. Brother Overture. Amen. And praise God for your obedience. God is looking from above down upon you. He said, you're the faithful servant. Amen. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And thank Michelle for, for ministering. And, 
And if you would all pray, um, just regarding our time together, that God would bring um, people from all walks, all faiths, all lifestyles, all things, so that we could come together and share our experiences, share our life stories, uh, because I don't want it to be all about me teaching. I, you know, we'll guide it and we'll have some foundation, and I want us to explore that. But I think that in these end times, the Word of God says, forsake, in, out of the book of Hebrews, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, so much more so as you see the day approaching. And we see the day approaching of how much evil is in the earth and that we need each other. We need these giftings and callings that each of us have. So, you know, if, if God has you to be a part of, of this gathering, pray about your part. Um, pray and ask God, Lord, what would you have me contribute? What, what would you have me interject? Because, you know, we're going to be going through these scriptures about in Christ. And so next week we're going to be talking about new creations in Christ and old things being passed away. Right. Right. Yes, amen. And that's the important thing of staying in the word is be then you begin to know what's of God and what's the devil trying to kill, steal, and destroy. And we read that scripture out of Romans 10, 9, and 10 about confessing with the Lord and and um, and then talking about um, the enemy coming and killing, stealing, and destroying. He hates, he hates gatherings like this, and he will, he will try to stop us from gathering together. So I appreciate each and every one of you taking time to come out. And, and uh, you know, I ask that you just pray about this Bible study, pray about your part, pray about, you know, whether or not you would, you would continue. Because this is open again for whosoever. People can come, people can go. And our part is to just share what God has called us to do. Amen? Amen. Any other questions or comments before we leave this morning? Praise the Lord. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your word. You said any time we gather together around your word, we're changed. You cause us to go from glory to glory. You fill us with joy unspeakable. And so, Father, I'm asking that you fill each and every one of these who came out today, Father, with your joy with your peace, with your life, Father, with your direction for, for their lives, Lord, and, and what they are to, to contribute and to, to be in the body of Christ, Father, at, at large. And I thank you, Father, for all of the giftings and the talents and the callings that are even just represented here today. Father, you've done great and marvelous things in each of our lives, and Lord, we're thankful. We're a thankful people that we can call upon the name of the Lord. Father, that, that you do redeem our lives from destruction, that you uphold us in your right hand. Father, that you have crowned us with glory. You give us the mind of Christ. And Lord, you help us to understand your word as we open it up. You reveal your word to us by your Holy Spirit. And you help each and every one of us and in the day-to-day -day situations and circumstances that we find ourselves in, Lord. You strengthen our bodies. You strengthen our minds. Father, you cause a blessing to flow into our households. You watch over us and you keep us, O oh God. And we give you all praise and all thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So uh, you're welcome to stay and, and like I say, partake of uh, Michelle got some refreshments.